Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. We are glad that you're here. We're thankful for our visitors that are with us today. and uh, We hope that if you have any questions or comments, you'll be sure to ask those. And uh, we'd be glad to answer. In Acts chapter 9, we read of a man named Saul of Tarsus. And we know, of course, that Saul, who later became Paul, made it his goal and purpose in life to persecute Christians. And he was on his way to Damascus to do such. It's kind of interesting that uh, we never read about Saul ever having any problems finding Christians uh, to persecute. How is it that he was always so able and it was so easy for him to find Christians? It's not like you can look at a person and just know that an individual is a Christian. We don't wear name tags. Uh, they didn't wear special clothing that marked them as Christians. And so we ask ourselves, how is it that Saul was so easily able to always find Christians to persecute? And I think... Of course, the reason for that is that Christians have always been an assembling people. They have always uh, assembled. It is a part, an integral part of who and what we are as followers of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Hebrew writer warns us and encourages us not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The, the phrase in this verse, and this is a verse we use every time we think about attendance. The phrase in this verse, as is the manner of some, it comes from the Greek word ethos. And that you may recognize as the word from which we get ethic. If we talk about a man or a woman and we say they have a good work ethic, what we are suggesting is that as a habit, as a rule, that person is a good, a hard worker. They make it a habit to be a hard worker and to do good work. And so this word ethos, it means a custom, a manner, or a habit. And so then let us ask the question, what is our custom? What is our habit when it comes to assembling with the saints? Because this passage tells us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as is the manner or custom of some. The habit, of course, of some is that, you know, every time the doors are open, they're going to be at the worship service. Uh, whether we're talking Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday worship, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday midweek Bible study, they're going to be there. For some, the habit for worship is different. Maybe they'll be there, you know, Sunday morning for Bible class and Sunday morning worship, but then uh, not no other time. Or maybe they only come for Sunday morning worship, and that's their habit in regard to worship. Let us realize, and I think we realize, that New Testament Christians didn't just meet once a week. They didn't just meet on Sundays. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we read in regard to the New Testament Christians, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So you drop down to verse 46 of Acts chapter 2, and it says, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Certainly they met, they assembled together more than just once a week on Sunday. If you look over in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, we have the account there of Peter when he had been arrested. And we read in verse 12 that he came to the house of Mary where many were gathered together praying. Here's another example where the saints had come together and assembled in this case for the purpose of praying with one another. And so Christians have always been an assembling people. 
Well, we ask ourselves, well, how often should the saints meet? Okay, you say they did it, um, you know, on a daily basis in the scriptures. What about us today? And how is that decided? And I think, of course, we know that really it falls upon the elders of the church to make the decision of, of when we're going to meet. In the sense, we know we have to meet on Sunday. That's commanded, and we're going to see that. But in terms of other opportunities to assemble, that's up to the elders. You know, in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, Peter talks to the elders and tells them to shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. The word shepherd, that implies to feed, to provide for. And uh, we know that as members of that flock, we, as sheep in that flock, we are to, Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over us. The elders are our overseers. That's, that's part of their job as shepherds. And so when they make decisions about when the church is going to meet, then we, as the sheep, um, are obligated to obey that. Notice in this passage, Hebrews 13, 17, it says in regard to these ones who rule over us, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. The elders, when they make decisions about um, you know, when we're going to meet, when we're going to assemble and study the Bible, um, they do this out of love and concern. They do this because they understand, as the scriptures teach, that we as human beings, we need to assemble and encourage and strengthen one another on a continuing basis in order for us to um, stay faithful. Now I understand, of course, that there are many valid reasons for an individual to miss worship, and I, I want to get that out of the way right now. Of course there are valid reasons for us to miss worship, um, as, as Christians. A person, for example, who is very ill um, may not be physically able to come to worship service. Or maybe there's an individual who could physically get in the car and get to worship service, but you know, they're contagious and, and certainly you know, they, it would be unwise for them to come to service and, and get everyone else sick. Um, sometimes jobs get in the way. You know, it's not what we want, but maybe we have a job that occasionally makes us uh, have to work during the time that the saints are assembling. And we don't like it. We wish it weren't that way. And whenever we can, we're there. But occasionally our work might get in the way. And, and that's, again, understandable. But where do we draw the line then? We're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so we ask the question, what makes an absence acceptable? And what makes an absence unacceptable? And I think the answer really comes down to this. When you are capable of attending a worship service and you choose not to assemble, then you've done wrong. Then you've committed sin. And I have nine reasons I want to go through rather quickly. We're not going to tarry too long on any one of these. We have nine which we want to get through, but I have nine reasons that I think are very clear in showing why it is wrong to choose not to be here when you could be. Number one, if I choose to attend, I show that I support spiritual things. But if I choose not to attend, I show apathy towards spiritual things. Okay? So if I choose to attend, I say that spiritual things, spiritual matters are important to me. And if I choose not to, I'm saying spiritual things are not that important to me. Or at least there are other things more important to me uh, in my life. In Romans 8 and verse 1, you remember Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there is a no condemnation to those who walk in Christ. Those who are in Christ don't walk according to the flesh. Now what does that mean? They don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Walking according to the flesh means that I'm walking according to, or my priorities are the earthly and fleshly concerns that are not really part of a spiritual matter. We're talking about physical, earthly concerns. Walking according to the Spirit means that I'm conducting my life according to the teachings of Christ. 
according to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. And so there's, I want to be where there's no condemnation. I need to walk after Christ um, and walk according to the Spirit. Now you drop down to verse 6 of Romans chapter 8. We read, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to be carnally minded or to mind the things of the flesh is death. We're talking about spiritual death there, but to mind the things of the spirit will give us life and peace. I think that we all would agree that attending the assembly of the saints is minding things of the spirit. Um, the, the spirit, after all, through Hebrews, the Hebrew writer tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to remember God is not mocked. Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. I need to be concerned about spiritual things. When I, when I set time aside to come to a worship service I am minding spiritual things. When I choose not to be here when I could, I'm saying spiritual things are not really that important to me. Number two, when I choose to attend, I'm doing a thing that is obviously good. When I choose to attend, I'm doing a thing that is obviously good. And if I choose not to attend, I am neglecting a thing that is obviously good. I'm neglecting a thing. That is obviously good. Of course, we think of James 4 and verse 17, where James tells us, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I, I can't imagine there's anybody here who would suggest that worship is not a good thing. That assembling with the saints is not a good thing. Obviously, it's a good thing, and it's good to be here. Therefore, to choose... Not to go means that I don't want to do that which is good. I want to do something that well, maybe isn't evil but isn't as good. It means I don't want to do that which is good. Him who knows to do good. Is it good to go to worship? Yes, it is. Now, some might argue, well, you know, I, I, I chose not to, do, not to go to worship, but I'm going to do something else that's good. Okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to, you know, spend time with family. I'm going to do this or that. I'm going to do something else, which is good. Keep that in mind. Uh, point number seven is going to deal with that. Point number seven deals with priorities. All right, so number three then. When I choose to attend, I am receiving and giving needed encouragement. And when I choose not to attend, I am neither receiving nor giving needed encouragement encouragement. Back to the passage there in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. Notice the Hebrew writer says in verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And again he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So verse 24 tells us, let us consider one another. When we attend worship, we're doing that at least partly because we're considering one another in order to offer one another encouragement, to strengthen one another. And when we choose to be somewhere else, really it boils down to we're being selfish. I don't, I don't want to offer my brothers and sisters encouragement. I want to do what I want to do right now. I don't want to go to assembly. We need to realize that worship is not just about you. Sometimes you'll hear people say, I don't get anything out of worship. Um, I don't go on the singing Sunday nights because I don't really like to sing. And so I'm not going to go on the singing service when we do that. Well, again, worship isn't about you. It's not just about what you get out of worship. We are also here to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our worship, when we worship, is not just vertical in nature. It is not just between us and God. We also know it's about encouraging and exhorting one another. And so there's a horizontal aspect to it as well. 
Not only am I worshiping God and, and praising him, but I am encouraging and strengthening my brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, so if I choose to be somewhere else, I'm saying that's not really that important to me that I encourage you. And I'm also saying I don't want your encouragement. I, those, uh, I hesitate to say, or, but how much concern goes into members who don't attend? Okay, how much effort and concern and prayer the elders put into members who, who won't attend when they could be here. Um, it, it is not only you're not encouraging, you're discouraging when you're not here when you could be. I'm saying these things because we love you, okay? And we want all of us to make it to heaven. And worship is certainly a part of us going to heaven. Point number four. When I choose to attend, I'm obeying an explicit command. But when I choose not to attend, I'm disobeying an explicit command. Again, I don't have too much here to say that we haven't already said. Again, Hebrews 10, 25 and 26. We've already read 25, but notice also verse 26. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Assembling with the saints is an explicit command. Okay, some of them might say, okay, I, I attend, I assemble with the saints. How often do I have to, though? Uh, where does it say I have to be here every time the doors open? What we need to realize is that when we choose even one time not to be here, then we've committed a sin. When we could be here and we choose not to, then we've committed a sin. Notice verse 26. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. I think what we see here is a progression that the Hebrew writer is getting at. If, if we choose to absent ourselves from the assembly, that usually starts a process. Okay, A person who stops attending regularly usually is starting a process that leads to all out apostasy or falling away from the faith. And we need to realize that, you know, the reason it's wrong for missing a hundred services is the same reason it's wrong to miss one. Again, when we could be here and we choose not to. It's a violation of an explicit command when we choose not to be here. Number five, if I choose to attend, I'm learning. And if I choose not to attend, I'm contributing to my ignorance. God places great emphasis on learning, knowledge, and growing. He, Hosea 4 and verse 6, he says in regard to his, his people Israel, they are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. Now let me suggest or ask, if I could be here but choose to go do something else, am I rejecting knowledge? Well, in a sense, he says, because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priest over me. Okay. Um, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, Peter tells us, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, we're told to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, we have what we call here the Christian graces, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. It's one of those graces that we're to add. And notice down in verse 8, if these things are yours and abound. Knowledge is one of those things. that You need to have knowledge. You need to abound in knowledge. You'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider this illustration. Two 10-year-old boys uh, attend services. Each time they attend a service, they learn one thing. Okay. They learn one thing every time they attend a service. The first boy attends services one time a week. He's there for worship on Sunday mornings. The second boy... He's at services four times a week. He's there for Sunday Bible class. He's there for Sunday worship. He's there for Sunday evening. He's there on Wednesday, midweek Bible study. So he's four times a week. 
At the end of a year, boy number one, he'll have learned 52 things. And you think, well, that's pretty good. He learned 52 things. But stop and consider that boy number two, he's learned 208 things. Now, extend that out over a lifetime. Say these two boys live to be 80 years old. Boy number one, he's learned 3,640 things. Boy number two, though, has learned 14,560 things. Now, in view of the emphasis that God places on knowledge and growing in knowledge, which boy would you rather be come judgment day? The one who has taken advantage of every opportunity possible to gain more knowledge and increase in the knowledge of our Lord. Or the one who just tries to do the bare minimum in getting by. Number six. If I choose to attend, I'm setting a good example. If I choose not to attend, I'm setting a a bad example. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, Paul tells Timothy, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. It's interesting. Uh, in our text here, Timothy's told to be an example to the believers. That's New King James. If you look at the King James Version, he says to, he's to be an example of the believers. Which one is right? Well, I would suggest to you that both of those statements are true. We're to be an example to believers. But we're also, in regard to our relationship with the world, we are to be an example of believers to those in the world. So we are to set a good example for other believers, and we're to set an example, a good example, uh, for those who are outside of the church by our faithful attendance. We need to think about what kind of example are we setting for our children when we, when in regard to our habits. In regard to worship, what kind of example? Do I want my children to learn my habit in regard to worship? Or am I, by my example, teaching my child so that they will grow stronger in the faith? Or by my example, am I teaching my child how to become unfaithful and eventually fall away? I have a poem I want to read. It's called, Please Daddy, Let's Go, and the author is unknown. A little girl with shining eyes, her upturned face aglow, said, Daddy, it's almost time for Sunday school, you know. Let's go and hear of Jesus' love, of how he died for all, to take them to his home above, who on his name will call. Oh no, said Daddy, not today. I've worked hard all week. And I must have one day of rest, and fishing's fine, they say. So run along, don't bother me, we'll go another day. Months and years have passed away, but Daddy hears that plea no more. Let's go to Sunday school. Those childish days are o'er. And now that Daddy's growing old and life is almost through, he finds some time to go to church, but what does daughter do? She says, oh, daddy, not today, was out almost all night. I've got to get a little sleep. Besides, I look a fright. Then daddy lifts a trembling hand to brush away the tears. Again, he hears that pleading voice distinctly through the years. He sees a small girl's upturned face, upturned eyes, upturned with eyes aglow, saying, it's time for Sunday school, please, daddy. Won't you go? We need to understand, and I want this to burn into your memories, Romans 14, 7. None of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. One might say, I'm not going to attend worship, and I'll deal with the consequences. That decision doesn't hurt anybody else. Not true. Not true. You want to go to the judgment and, and, you know, accept whatever God decides, that's fine. But understand, you're setting an example for your children. If you don't have children, maybe for other children, other people's children, for your neighbors, for other Christians. You don't live into yourself. Other people notice how you behave. 
I need to attend worship because it sets the right example. Number seven. If I choose to attend, I demonstrate that my priorities are properly arranged. If I choose not to attend, I demonstrate that my priorities are not properly arranged. We don't need to spend a lot of time on this. We know that Jesus told us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We are to seek first the kingdom of God. This is a passage that talks about priorities. That the kingdom of God is to be a priority. When you choose or when I choose not to attend, am I putting the kingdom of God first in my life? What do our neighbors think when they see us out and about during a time the church is meeting? I'll tell you what they think. They think, mm -hmm. They claim that they're a Christian, but look, they're out here mowing the yard and the church is meeting. And they not only then have you been a bad example... You've also, at least in their mind, given them an excuse not to be concerned about spiritual matters. We at least give the impression, when we choose not to attend with the saints, we at least give the impression that the kingdom of God is not important to us. Or at least that it's not the most important thing to us when we choose to do something else. Number eight. If I choose to attend, I am present to praise God. If I choose not to attend, I commit an affront to God personally. Jesus said in Luke 10 and verse 27, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we love God in that way, are we going to deny God something that he wants? We read in John 4 and verse 23 that the Father is seeking true worshipers to worship Him. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? If so, then give Him the worship that He deserves by being here. To choose not to be at worship is to really insult God. And say, God, you know, there are things that are more important to me than praising you. Which you desire. Remember the story of Nadab and Abihu. We're not going to read this. But Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. Nadab and Abihu. They, they worshipped. But they offered profane worship. They offered something to God. That, that God didn't want. And in God's response to that. He, he, put them to, he killed them. But in verse 3. When he's talking to Aaron. Their father. It says. This is what the Lord spoke. Saying. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Aaron didn't, wasn't, didn't argue for his sons because he understood that they had insulted God by their false worship. I would suggest that we can insult God by not worshiping. By choosing not to be there when others are there to offer praises up to him. Finally, number nine. When I choose to attend, I may unintentionally sin. I'll explain what I mean by that. But if I choose not to attend, I sin according to plan and purpose. Now, what do I mean by if I choose to attend, I may unintentionally sin? Well, I think we all know that the good worship takes effort, okay? Okay. And that there are possibly times that we come to worship when we don't worship the way that we should. Our mind is not focused the way that it should, should be. We're distracted and thinking about other things. We know that true worship involves spirit and truth. John 4 and verse 24. And so there may be times that I am in the assembly where I don't worship the way that I should. And I have sinned, but it's unintentional. I didn't wake up that morning planning to be unfocused. On the other hand. If I choose not to be there. When I could be. There's no doubt. I, I've sinned. I've made a decision that is wrong. And Romans 13 and verse 14 tells us. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. To fulfill its lust. I think Paul's saying there. Um, don't. Don't plan to sin. Plan to do right. Now, if you stumble and falter, then repent and ask God's forgiveness and he'll give it. But don't plan to do wrong. 
Make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the lust. I know that a lot of times when the preacher preaches on attendance, people roll their eyes. Here we go again. We do it out of love, though. The elders' concern, my concern, your brothers' and sisters' concern is that you go to heaven. We want you to go to heaven. We want you to grow, become stronger Christians. We want you to stay faithful through the good times in your life and through the trials in your life. And that strength, that maturity comes by assembling with the saints. And when we choose not to do that, we've forsaken the assembly of ourselves together. As we conclude this lesson, we want to take a moment to offer an invitation. Perhaps there are some Christians here who, maybe it's in regard to the, the lesson that was preached, or maybe it's in regard to some other aspect of their lives. There is sin in their life that they need to correct, they need to repent. And if that's the case, you could come forward and we'd be glad to pray for you and with you um, in order that God would forgive you of those sins. But Maybe there are some here who have never obeyed the gospel and you're not yet a Christian. If that describes you, we're, we're offering you an opportunity right now to put God first in your life. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then please, won't you obey His commands, repent of your sins, confess your faith, be baptized as He commanded, living faithfully thereafter. Whether you've never obeyed the gospel and you need to today, or you've obeyed the gospel in the past but have since fallen away, if there's any way we can help, we encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.